Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rail's 430th New Social Environment. I'm Cal, Curatorial Assistant here at The Rail. And I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation on the subject of Richard Serra's drawings between James Lawrence and Fong H. Bui on the occasion of Serra's show at Ordevas in London. We're, th we're thrilled to have the poet Micah Ballard here who will read to close today's program. A few quick notes before we get started. Here at The Rail, we are celebrating our 21st anniversary by working on our first ever endowment campaign. This initiative will ensure the print edition of The Rail and our public programming celebrating cross-pollination in the arts, humanities, and sciences all remains free and accessible for generations to come. Please check the chat for more information and links. The Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter, and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded lands and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsi, Munsi, and Lene Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and the Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions. And now to introduce today's guest and host. Critic and historian of post-war and contemporary art, James Lawrence, is a contributor to the Burlington Magazine and Gagosian Quarterly. His writings appear in numerous gallery and museum publications around the world, including an essay alongside art historian Richard Schiff in Richard Serra Drawings, work some, comes out of work, Quince House Bregens, 2008, and most recently in Richard Serra Drawings, or Devas Books, 2021. And artist, writer, and independent curator Fong H. Bui is the publisher and artistic director of the Brooklyn Rail, the River Rail, Rail Editions, and Rail Curatorial Projects. Fong, take it away. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much. Um, I'm, I was talking to James yesterday um, about, actually, I was very jealous that he spent something like a good eight days looking at Richard Strolling <laughs> in the studio. And was it 2006 or eight, James? Uh, 2008, and it was about eight hours over three different days, yeah. Wow. So I, you know, I didn't have that pleasure, but I have a, a similar kind of pleasure in that I spoke to Richard in his Tribeca laugh about his most memorable Traveling Rowan Perspective, why it was in the Met in the summer of 2011, and it was printed in the rail um, soon after. It was a beautiful show, important show, brilliantly curated by Bernie Rose, Michelle White at the Manil Collection and Gary Garros at FS MoMA. And, um, and since I just read your insightful catalog essay this morning, Accumulated Experience, about this new group of drawings referred as the Orchard Street series early this morning. Uh, I was glad to have felt whatever I knew of Richard's mediation with space through his highly personal and inventive use of materials. It's essentially, I mean, I just need to be thrown out all of what I know. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this new body of work. Um, yeah, for I now, to, to, to need to rethink in a way, reframe everything, you know, because it demands everything else seems so inadequate. Uh, so I'm thrilled to, to have this opportunity, James, to talk with you about Richard's um, intense inquiry and perpetual exploration of his own practice of drawing and how it directly or indirectly relate to his own sculpture or remaining an anonymous negotiation with spatial issue rather than depicting or uh, illustrating a situation or narrative and so on. So I like to also like to, before we start, like to um, thank my old friend, Pilar Odovas and Natasha Rosenblatt at Odovas Gallery. Of course, with Kyle's mother, um, Trina McKeever at Richard Serra Studio for providing image for this conversation. Um, so yeah, I uh, I like to start first because I was so lucky, James, having sat just right in front uh, across from uh, the great Peter Brook, the film director and theater um, as an event, I think it was uh, like two, three years, two years ago with Lee Boninger, the president of Columbia University who organized this wonderful gathering uh, honoring Peter and uh, Marie-Hélène Estien, his, his, um, his longtime collaborator on the occasion of their new play, Why, which I went to see. And I just wanted to um, read this part because essentially 
relate to the sense of touch. So here Peter say, we are part of people and people are part of us. And we find ways to contribute and encourage the best or the better to survive the worst in the world of humanity. And that's what our work is about. So much can vibrate in one or two simple words. And for me, he said, the word is the most important in everything we do is touch. You can look it up in every dictionary, what the word touch means. When in direct experience, everyone in any race, in every part of the world, of any age would know when they experience a moment of, wow, ah, it's touch. That's how true memory is ingrained on us and becomes vibrant and in the end, useful. And this is how I feel about Rich's sense of touch also. Uh, in your catalog, a cumulative experience. You mentioned from early on in Richard's childhood, he came to terms with the world by converting facts, James, around him into a personal tactile experience in which the act was as important as essential at the end result. I've always felt by making drawing on wax paper, I mean, I remember in that very similar interview, which is highly slippery surface because the work that undoubtedly must have required the young Richard to put greater pressure with his Crayola or crayon Conte in order to make the any legible marks again, quite often the hard ground of the street. I remember he said that it, most often he would put on the street, the uneven, the, 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 the undulation of the asphalt. Therefore the line was broken, creating a graffiti-like surface. So I know he teased me trying too hard to solve the mystery like Sackler Home and whatnot. But I think that to me, that sense of touch early on, I wonder must have, you know, ingrained in him because it's not something that you gone to art school, James, where you would be taught to use a lightest pencil you know, like the coon in eight edge, you know, on the port that we laid the coon in, or any kind of conventional way of being trained to draw. He was, after all, uh, an English major at Santa Barbara University. So let's start from there, shall we? Yes, I think that's a good place to start. Uh, I'm delighted to join you for this form. Um, I, I think the topic of touch is particularly germane right now for obvious reasons. We have all lived for a long time now under conditions where uh, everything we took for granted about touch, about touching each other, uh, about interacting with the world uh, has essentially been uh, nullified. Uh, we don't live like that anymore. We need to find substitutes and surrogates and, and something like this series is one example of doing that creatively and successfully uh, but we all try to do it in some different way uh, i think touch is something we take for granted to the extent that we almost entirely forget how to do it or what it is until we can't do it anymore until we no longer have that capacity uh, so there's a huge poignancy to it i think um, Thinking about uh, Richard as an artist, it's it, it, it's probably the case that, that practically everything useful that we learn about touch early on gets challenged in art school uh, or with any kind of training. Mm -hmm. And perhaps one of the most noticeable thing about Richard's work, if you, if you don't know anything about Richard's work, is that it seems to align with so few, few conventional rules of what art is supposed to be like. Um, you know, the, the sculpture doesn't necessarily seem the way people might expect a sculpture to be. The drawings certainly don't seem to conform to most conventional definitions of what drawing is. Um, and yet, I think Sarah has successfully over the years been able to uh, boil down the essential components of 
what's involved in making works of art without being excessively hung up about disciplinary boundaries. So it's very pragmatic. And in that respect, I think it has a lot to do with um, fairly basic habits of living in the world. Um, but touch for Richard is not going to be a, a precious and over theorized thing. It's going to be a consequence of working with material in a particular place at a particular time to get a particular kind of result or maybe to experiment with possible results. And if your early formation is you know, drawing on butcher paper on a rough surface, just working with what's to hand, however it is, in order to do something you simply enjoy doing and find useful, uh, then you can't get too hung up about it. You don't have the luxury of um, over refinement. Mm -hmm. And I, I certainly think that early on, uh, probably Richard's habits were uh, definitively pragmatic. So when he was young and working the way so many of us do, just drawing because we get pleasure from it and because we get approval for it and because it's, a, it's an interesting way to come to terms with the world and also to somehow uh, have a surrogate for touching things we can't touch. We can't touch the zoo animals that he drew, for example. Um, he was drawing engine components that his brother and father were working with when he was probably too young to work with them himself. Uh, it is a way of engaging with real things in real space and real time. Uh, something we all do on a moment to moment basis and yet hardly ever think about until we have a reason to think about it because we can't do it anymore. It's so true, isn't it? Carl, can we see the first set of drawing here, the drawing at the circuit, this serial? I think there's uh, 24 pieces. This is what really knocked me over, James. It was yeah. 1972. You know, when I um, saw this, um, which is at the entrance when you enter the, the retrospective at the Met, I couldn't help but to think of early Delta Blues masters, you know, <laughs> you know, I'm serious, like Josh White or, you know, uh, Bucker White or Robert Johnson and many others, you know, because these was Black American were given probably why they were slaves, you know, in cotton field and whatnot. So they were given guitar. Uh, by their master, by their owner, and they couldn't mediate with the European sound, the tuning, so to speak. So they began to experiment with the string and they probably began experiment with find way to, to now we call it the, you know, the, the, the so-called tuning, you know, like uh, extra tuning. I'm sure they were trying to find way that resonate the sound where they came from, from their memory, you know? That's when they began to open tune and then break the bottle and st start doing the slide on the string. Mm -hmm. My feeling is that that physicality will immediately associate my own experience reading this multitude of line, vertical line. I mean, if you were an art student or an artist any kind, you wouldn't dare to leave them like that. Mm -hmm. You would think they crude, simple, you know, where are your training finesses? Where is the ankh, the dalakwa, you know? Um, and all the masters, you look at forever. You mean, I know that you have an image of Da Vinci, which I'm dying to, to, to hear what you have to say about it. But that was my impression, immediately. I what think it's an understandable impression. It's, uh, again, we are constrained by our own habits of thought. And if you come to a work like this, uh, if you look at this expecting it to conform to um, the graphic conventions we have been told over and over again, that's what drawing is. Or even if we come to it with a, uh, an understanding of what uh, seriality from the 1960s was somehow supposed to look like, a rules-based approach to art, mm -hmm. uh, something like this does not seem to conform to that and you can simultaneously 
wonder why that is, uh, and yet also see it for what it is, um, pretty much the way you can listening to uh, a very simple line in Delta Blues. It's, uh, it's a very personal thing in the end, even if it seems to follow a basic structure that one has heard from many other blues tracks because there is a particular way of doing things. Uh, but everyone has a different touch. Every guitarist has a different touch. Uh, every singer has a different timbre. And so there's huge variation. Yes. Um, something like this maybe announces its personal qualities. And there is that register of drawing that's always been pleasurable because it's, um, it's provisional. It's the sketch. It's the unfinished. It's the... Uh, inchoate idea that hasn't yet taken shape and there's a feeling of being on the ground whilst it's doing so somehow or, or in a case like this where um, perhaps perhaps it was a way for Richard to come to terms on a personal manual scale with something that would be uh, a large sculpture that would exceed that kind of reach uh, so it doesn't have the anxiety of being penned in. I think there are um, dozens of drawings related to circuit, quite a lot of them are on newsprint like this. Uh, and so it's, it's fertile, it doesn't seem self contained. I mean, this is a very yeah. tidy and handsome installation. And it has that ring of um, institutional compartmentalization. Uh, but you somehow intuit that there's so much more to this than you're seeing just from this particular set, just on this particular wall. Uh, you understand that there's a language going on. Yeah. And drawing is particularly good at getting that across, I think, uh, that it's the engine of artistic thought. Yes. So it's counting the thought in the most elemental way in yes. some way, too. Uh, but I'm not so sure about the... Uh, the absence of anxiety, James. Maybe, maybe we if we look at the next image, cow, the the second Goethe. This is like the, one of the early great um, in you know situated or situational drawing or site specific drawing. Um, this is at um, Akira Ikeda Gallery in Tokyo, 1985. I know that we have a second view here, cow. So we can see the fuller um, perspective of these two pieces here. And then I thought for the sake of amplify the physicality, I asked how to put in um, one of my favorite painting at the Museum d'Orsay by uh, Gustave Cabot. It's called the Floor Scraper. So I remember being in Paris in 1998, and that's how I remember the image of how Richard create those drawings were like, James. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's the assertiveness of what required a physical labor, like workmanlike labor. Yes. Which is so essential way to understand his drawings, the, the verve of his act making the drawing, so to speak. And I, I was very compelled by it because, you know, we know that he only take a, one class, maybe two, I don't remember, he say one or two or, or more with Howard Wassel, uh, who became his mentor um, in the last year in, in undergrad um, in college, you know? And then it was Warsaw who encouraged Richard to send a portfolio of 12 drawing to Yale Graduate School, which Richard was admitted. And it's interesting to me to mention that he was a painter in graduate school. Yeah. I was told by Chuck Close, who else, Rackstro Downs, that Richard was making painting somewhere between Pollock and Hans Hartmann, while mm -hmm. Chuck was making painting between the Kunin and Rauschenberg, and Rachto was out hell all, all the way. Anyway, there's more all those people who told me, but we know on a traveling grant in 64, right after he graduated, he spent a year in Paris, where he saw Brancusi studio at the Musée de, de Modère, 
um, he certainly absorbed the aura of Brancusi studio. The same can be said about Giacometti, who he and Philip Glass would follow, you know, like groupie really, <laughs> seeing him sitting there with in the, you know, the famous uh, cafe La Coupe, you know, with pen stuck in his hand and plaster in his hair and wax stuck in his ear and whatnot. He's carried the aura studio. I know Richard was super impressed by that. You know, the idea of carrying your work in, your work with you everywhere you go. But when he went to the Fulbright um, to Italy the year after, he just quit being a painter altogether. Just quit, you know, realize we don't need to go through the detail, you know, experience Velasquez, you know, La Marinas and whatnot, but he just quit and began to be playful. Of mm -hmm. course, the very important show for Richard was when he experimented with stuff in live animal, uh, including chicken, rabbit, and live pig, and all that. I know that it was, um, I spoke to George Woodman, and Betty Woodman, because Betty helped Richard to get the animal because he spoke Italian, <laughs> Italian. You know, that was his first show in Rome at the Gallery de uh, La, La Cicita, La Lita, you know, just before uh, after Povera took off, so to speak. So my question is that, do you think, even if he quit painting entirely to become a sculpture, sure, not knowing what kind of sculpture we made, making then, but do you think there was an everlasting pictorial language from his training as a painter somehow translate into sculpture unconsciously? It's difficult to say uh, specifically because uh, pretty much by definition, this is um, in, in, in terms of Richard's career, this is uh, kind of uh, prehistoric. It isn't really recorded. He, he can, he will tell you something about uh, what kind of thing he was painting, and other people can tell you. But uh, uh, I haven't seen it, and I don't have any first-hand evidence to go on. I, uh, I think it's, it, it's obviously, I think very much the case, and it's pretty obvious that I think this uh that no experience is really wasted or shared and in so far as yeah, he spent some time as a painter I, I, of course i would expect that would definitely enter into his practice more generally um but i suspect painting um i i suspect there was a process of elimination that went on wow. uh, where what might have seemed like plausible options that were available to him when he was a painting student um, gradually fell away. So he wasn't satisfied with doing uh, second order gestural painting. He wasn't satisfied with working with chromatic matrices like Ellsworth Kelly or something like that. Yeah. Um, all of the things that uh, uh, a sophisticated art student at the late 50s or early 60s might engage with um, somehow didn't offer uh, what he, I guess, was starting to want. And I think what he wanted was an openness that he couldn't find in painting for him. Other painters maybe did, but he didn't. Um, and where Velasquez is relevant, it's to do with the fact that I think maybe that was the conclusive moment where he thought this is uh, this is ultimately too constrained for him. It's too immutable. It's pictures of life, even if it's abstract rather than life itself. And he wanted an openness and a boundlessness that uh, for him, maybe resided in objects, but, but certainly didn't necessarily reside in painting. So having been a painter, possibly the natural instinct is to become playful, find out what might work, and the, the habitats you mentioned, the live and stuffed animals. Yeah. Um, I think to some extent he, you know, he, he's treated that as a, a, a period of... Um, uh, novitiate where he was just throwing ideas out and seeing what would stick um, but it probably does start to uh, narrow things down um, that there's a there's a sense of general context that he wants to explore that painting can't do but maybe sculpture can or some other form can uh, so I think there probably is a 
there's a relationship between no longer painting and sculpture, and there probably are some techniques which were honed when he was a painter. Um, but I mainly see it in the the absence, the elimination of painting as something he would choose to do. And, and as much as he has worked in several media, notably painting has not been one of them, uh, to the extent that his drawings ever seem like they nudge up against the discipline of painting. Um, but there's always something that pulls them back very much into the realm of drawing, into the realm of the graphic. Uh, so painting has been, there's a painting shaped whole in his mature career uh, that possibly paints, possibly points to a significance that hasn't really been examined yet. It's super true. Yeah, we talk about briefly about Newman, but we have yet even contemplate on works or paintings like Clifford Steele and others, you know, um, not quite yet anyway, uh, that will be... <laughs> We should save that for the next conversation, Jane. Kyle, <laughs> can we see um, the next two images? Partly because I want to share with our viewer uh, the scale of it, and again the the, the physicality, which is abstract slavery. Um, paint stick here on Belgian linen, and the other one, also my incredible favorite, blank, which you also asked for, James. Mm -hmm. um, Yes, I mean, this is the installation view at Bloomhelman, which is not the same for, for my own experience. I have seen quite similar, which is um, the piece. We don't have it here, but uh, I think maybe we have it, but maybe we don't. It's called Union, which he made specifically for the Met show. It's similar. Yeah. It, it's only different is that the, the two canvases extended, were extended all the way to the top of the ceiling. So it was trapping the space, so to speak. It, you, you feel the container that you are in it. Uh, so you are perpetually aware of your own, um, that particular volume, which is architect volume of space and your own volume trapped by the, the two canvases. It's a very strange experience, you know, but this bring me, um, I don't know how to describe it, but I think there's a there's two attributes about Richard at the moment. I'm thinking James. One uh, is that, as I say earlier, you and I talk about he always asks simple questions about elemental things that we tend to take for granted. You know, anything that Richard doesn't understand, he became most inquisitive about. <clears throat> and, and this implies sense of perpetual alertness to everyday lives and events. I love the fact that he never failed to carry his sketchbook to exercise hands, eye coordination everywhere he goes, you know? So that's including thinking, reading and so on, which leads to definitely maybe related or not to his own incredible um, number two attribute namely space, uh, space being the, his own, I guess, mediation of human condition as a human condition, in mm -hmm. my opinion, uh, he feel most sensitive to is space. You know, uh, for some of us remember uh, when he did mention, for example, he walked around in one or two interview, he repeated it like he walked around, let's say a convexity of a curve back and forth to feel that convexity only to go to the other side, which only separate by maybe an inch or two inches of court steel um, sheet, you know, to discover there are the complete con uh, concavity. Hmm. So between convexity and concavity is separate by almost like a strand of hair. Mm -hmm. what separate truth and fault in some way. So it's a very, very simple uh, elemental discovery that we, again, take it for granted. He doesn't take it for granted. Um, so do you think when Richard amplified the criteria of playfulness or the spirit of um, experimentation, does it feed directly into his thinking of process or procedure that somehow generates the way he thinks 
uh, of his drawing in, in the same equal footing of his own sculpture? I think there's a, um, the, the first exhibition I wrote for was uh, given the subtitle Work Comes Out of Work, and it's an expression I've heard Richard use. It's a very, um, it's a fertile maxim, um, partly because it serves equally as a description of mundane activities, but it's also a, a, a perfect description of extremely rarefied pure research. Um, uh, when we think of playfulness, we think of, a, a, if you like, a, a particularly free kind of work. I mean, play requires effort, it requires the expenditure of energy, uh, a certain amount of concentrated thought quite often, uh, but it's thought of as somehow pleasurable in a way work can be thought of as a chore. Uh, but interesting work is play. And mm -hmm. th there is a general looseness uh, that I think attends Richard's work generally. And there's an anti-authoritarian aspect to that. I mean, it's easy to look at some of these large scale drawings and, um, and, and misread them as somehow um, coercive, that they are conditioning space and therefore forcing you to behave in a certain kind of way. Uh, whereas I think it's exactly not that. It's, if it's coercion, it's coercion as a reminder that um, spatially, we're always induced to be a certain way. I mean, you mentioned the convex and concave surfaces and the effect it can have on you as you walk past them, or it had on Richard as he walked past them. Um, well, you know, in a way, freedom comes from acknowledging that we are under those conditions, and yet we act to the extent we can, according to our own choices, moment to moment. Now, I think that's relevant in relation to this kind of site conditioning drawing, uh, because the viewer becomes somehow crucial. Uh, this work in particular, uh, Blank or, or Union for that matter at the Met Show, uh, they only succeed by virtue of standing between those walls and being able to alternate, being able to reconcile the opposites. Uh, so in that sense, it's extremely generous. It, it's an invitation uh, to, it's an invitation for us to play in a certain sense. We don't have to do a certain thing, but we do have to work. We do have to do something in relation to it for it to be rewarding. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that's an, that's an ethos that recurs with Sarah's work, uh, where actually it's, it, it's giving us a lot of latitude to be who we are. Yeah, you know, it is. It also is a it's a two sides of the same coin. James, I've been rereading quite a bit of, you know, uh, John Dewey. Mm -hmm. You know, where he described the experience of children when they play, when they experiment. They they don't make discrimination against why they making. Uh, let's say uh, an airplane paper airplane, you yeah. know, or making a drawing or painting. They do not separate between uh, making an image or building an image with the academic uh, training potentially or vocational learning. They, they, and above all, when children get excited about things, they don't censor their excitement. Mm -hmm. You know, it's so important to remind ourselves. I know it's kind of hard and difficult to put Richard in that context, but I remember years ago reading about Baudelaire. I don't know the word genius that is now for being like, it's now forbidden. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but Baudelaire did say that genius is no more than childhood recapture at will. And that's what we do as adults. We try to go back that, recapture that sense innocent, but really to be free to be free to maybe, maybe not to be free from, you know, mm -hmm. which is, what, you know, the, the four essay of liberty, Isaiah Berlin is all about two concepts of liberty, I must say. But, you know, still I, I was thinking about the lineator because you asked for it. Can we see the next one, Cal? I mean, yeah. to me, that's playful. It's it not intimidating. I know that I did, 
ten quite a few times below it and definitely felt the fear. <laughs> you know, it's going to be smooth into a French crepe, <laughs> not American uh, house of pancake for sure. But it was so incredible and just standing below. But when you step afar, you feel the space for sure. But I felt incredible joy because I know it was being playful. Am I right about this, James? Uh, I think so. I mean, it's um, it, it's a particularly satisfying one, this, because it's, uh, again, it gets back to this point you made uh, that so often um, Richard's dealing with the simple question uh, and the question that we don't think about and therefore we get thrown off because we don't think about it. I mean, as you say, you felt that fear standing under that plate. Uh, but I'm going to make the assumption that you fairly routinely stand in rooms with ceilings and floors above them and don't give it a moment's thought. Uh, you're probably more likely to have something drop on your head from you know, a, a piece of domestic architecture than you are from a very carefully installed work in a museum that really does not want to get sued. I mean, this is a very safe work of art, but it seems like it's not that. And, um, and so much of plays to do with risk uh, but yeah. it's to do with the the promise of risk without the actuality of risk think doing things that seem like they might be dangerous but aren't um, so you stand on this work and or you you stand in this work and the, the viewer becomes well literally crucial yeah completes it reconciles it it does not make sense without being specifically present in a particular location. Uh, you can look at it and you can understand what it is, but in order to activate it, you have to stand there. And by doing so, you are yourself activated. It's a, it's a reciprocal kind of relationship. And that's lively. And, and it is the satisfaction of uh, a simple thing, extraordinarily well done, rather than um, very precious, rarefied, um, elite aesthetics being put into play. Super true. Um, Kyle, can we see uh, Nova Scotia, number one, the drawing, uh, which is rare, do you know, James? This was made in 83, mm. and immediately, if we see the next, sculpture, the famous Clara Clara, also executed in the same year, rarely will find a drawing that lend itself to a sculpture made. And you ask Richard, he will refuse it, that he did not make and illustrate the fact from one drawing to becoming a sculpture for sure. But nevertheless, we have it here just to, to, you know, to bring up some point which you have in mind. Am I right, James? Yeah, uh, I mean, thinking about um... As you say, it, it's unusual to see such a close correspondence between the sculpture and the drawing. Yeah. Uh, but I, th I think there are certainly times when uh, this is especially true with uh, sketching in a notebook, where drawing is a kind of manual assimilation of sculpture that exceeds a gestalt reading. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's not available in the sculpture, and it's not supposed to be. It's something that is, is deliberately excluded. Uh, but it's nonetheless something that has a, a tantalizing promise. And one way to engage with it, perhaps, uh, is simply to draw it uh, or simply to draw in relation to it. Um, yeah. and, and so I think there's a, there's a natural sense of privacy uh, that comes with that. It's obviously true with drawings that are made in a notebook, although Richard has exhibited them at various times. They're basically private works. Uh, mm -hmm. And a drawing of this kind of size is something that has all of the associations, all of the connotations of uh, a private work, something that's meant to be looked at in a very intimate sense, close up, probably alone, uh, and with no expectation, but it really expands beyond itself. Uh, so, so it's, it's complete, uh, but it's also self-contained and the containment is to do with that direct relationship with whoever's viewing it. Uh, if it's in a notebook, most likely Richard himself, but mm -hmm. it, it applies whoever's seeing it. Um, 
what I had in mind partly with um, the sculpture, um, because it relates to space and some of the things we were talking about just now about playfulness. Um, in 2008, I was in Paris um, looking at some other sculpture and uh, this was installed. Uh, this had been reinstalled in the Tuileries Gardens. And uh, while I was walking through it, I noticed that um, there, there was no defacement. It had, there was no graffiti on it. There was no marker. It, it hadn't been vandalized, um, but it was covered with dusty footprints because obviously people had been uh, seeing how high they could raise their feet and make a mark on it. And this had become something of a thing. You know, one person had done it, somebody else had done it. It had become some sort of social competition. Um, mm -hmm. and these sculptures are challenges to our common spaces. And there are two ways to look at that, some of which have very unpleasant associations of um, prohibition. Um, mm -hmm. But the other way to look at it is that um, all of our space is shared, all of our space is held in common. Um, going back to the Peter Brook point, you know, we are always touching others. We are always touching things in the world. We don't exist in isolation. And a sculpture like this reminds us of that, uh, partly because of the way it uh, occupies uh, a public space uh, without mm -hmm. actually obstructing it in a in any legitimate sense. If you can't walk in a straight line, so what? Walk around it, walk past it. There are always alternatives, but it actually takes up really yeah. uh, not very much space at all. If you look at the sum total of um, ground area, the metal covers, it's not very much. Well, I mean, that's exactly the argument that he sued the US government for when Tilted Ark was taken away from him, you yes. know? That's another, been talked about, so there's no need for us to revisit the same old story, James. But I, yeah. I'd, um, I'm, I'm interested in right now, partly because of you also wanted to show, um, to lift, mm -hmm. which is, yes. Carl, could you show it just briefly? This is made in 67, it was a very important year for Richard. Um, because somehow it anticipate it anticipated his his nineteen seventy verb list with with every one of us any art student would know you know by by now really but I remember talking about verb list um, in my last interview with Richard um, I did bring up or I asked whether there were any possible inherent relationship to now that we see the Jasper John show, I just went down to Philadelphia to see it for the second show there. Now that that we 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 feel the presence of Jasper ter terrifically, so I asked whether it had relationship with Jasper's untitled drawing of 1964, uh, cut, tear, scrape, erase, in which he responded, his furless had nothing to do with Jasper, although he admired Jasper's work. It's rather inspired after having sat through a six hour lecture by Max Minter Fuller <laughs> at uh, Fairleigh Dickinson University. Would you believe it? And the lecture was called, I am a verb. And <laughs> Fuller would talk about um, Mulligan, you know, circum circumnavigating the globe and then switching immediately to a geodesic dome within two paragraphs, you know? I mean, he was just talking nonstop, pouring things out of tin air and Richard was so impressed that he just went home um, and made his verb bliss, but he insisted it, it's not no relationship. It's not like demonstrating uh, what he heard. Hmm. Uh, so, what are ways to describe richer intricate mediation between large form and the intimacy it generates? Does that make sense? Because mm, we, you yeah. and I have, yeah. It's I mean, a, we look at the union of Taurus and the spheres, and of course, I love Bellamy. That's another piece I, I admire, it's Sylvester. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Both sensation being so overwhelmed and intimidated. 
uh, by their tremendous gravity and yet it's so lyrical and, and, and light. I think probably uh, bringing up verbalist uh, at, at, at that point um, makes that question clearer. Um, it, it makes sense. I mean, it's uh, I, I, I can imagine a six hour lecture with Buckminster Fuller, the visionary, and Richard's response is a very, it, it's, you know, if, if it's Richard as a visionary, then it's a very matter of fact visionary. This is what we can do. This is another thing we can do. This is something we yeah. can do. And they are all very, um, I'm tempted to say universal human things. Practically any human being can do these things. Uh, and, and so there is a, without any fuss, uh, without any theory or theology or ideology about it, um, there, there's just something about the sum total of human capacity that set out with something like that. And it doesn't list everything, but the very fact that it is one sheet of paper tells you that there are plenty of other sheets of paper. This is just what he's been able to come up with right now. Uh, and yes, you know, of course, art students learn it, art historians learn about it, and it's tempting to see it as some kind of, um, um, some kind of conceptual thing, which it isn't. It, it, it's nothing of the kind because Richard went on to do these things. And yeah. so he, in this case, took a sheet of rubber. Um, it's a very rudimentary kind of thing. Uh, lift it up, it produces a volumetric form. It's a rather beautiful volumetric form. You go into a museum and see this and it's just, it just works. Uh, you can't exactly say why it works. Uh, it's got something to do with wit. It's got something to do with the economy of a, a perfect one-liner. It's got something yeah. to do with, the, the, again, the things that we take for granted as giving us satisfaction and then we get on with our day. Um, but the physical forces that are being harnessed uh, are complex. Uh, and describing what's going on in an artistic and formal sense is quite complex, uh, but it's also unnecessary. Uh, you'll see it so much quicker than you can describe it. Uh, you don't really have to get into what's going on with it. Um, so it's it attends to physical laws rather than aesthetic rules. It doesn't have that kind of code built into it. Uh, now, I think that with the reason why maybe even a, a monumental sculpture can nonetheless seem intimate is, is partly to do with the fact that it does call upon our physical involvement. It calls upon us to pass through it, walk around it. It calls upon us to be in relation to it. Um, but it also becomes very quickly apparent that it's engaging things that we do on a daily basis, just not in that way and not with those means at our disposal. Uh, so it, it, it speaks a language of of physical behavior that we all intuitively understand because we simply wouldn't be able to function in the world if we didn't. And that's quite an intimate thing. That's a very personal thing. It's universalizing, uh, but it's also deeply particular. Yes, it deeply particular is the good way to describe it, Richard, Richard because the, the, the early film, the structural film is definitely related to that singularity of act of one act, one verb each time. Um, but if we were to talk like this, James, we will go on for hours. I know mm -hmm. that we are doing this for the archive realm, <laughs> but I think we could speed it up so the Q&A can happen some point. Absolutely. Cal, uh, let's get back to the drawing, shall we? Let's, let's show the, the remember me whisper, the dust. Can you describe how this was made because what we're going to see after is so different. Well, it's, it's starting in the 1990s, uh, Richard's approach to making uh, drawings, but you know, up to about an arm span, up to about six or seven feet. Uh, he started to uh, put a reservoir of paint stick on a horizontal surface, uh, sometimes constrained by uh, a cardboard form at the perimeter, but not always, sometimes using wire mesh to hold it roughly in place, but not always. Uh, then he'd apply a layer of paper, uh, heavy duty paper, 
uh, and work on it from the bursa, uh, press it down into the pain stick. And so here you have, and you can kind of see it in an image, you have a you, you have lines and then more lines and then more lines as he swept onto it from the back with a tool. Uh, and eventually the material accumulates and in so doing it, it almost effaces the linear gestures that led to its creation. Uh, the end result is um, hefty, it weighs a lot. Uh, the surface is extremely variegated. Uh, it, 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 you can get quite lost in looking at it because it is astonishingly complex. Uh, but what it doesn't do is you know, record a, some kind of autographic gesture that makes a big deal of it being Richard Serra's gesture. He's working from the back. He doesn't know what it's going to look like until he lifts it up. Um, mm -hmm. If we end up seeing it, it obviously passed muster. Um, but it's somehow detached from him. He's just, um, uh, he's the foreman, as it were, of the material. Uh, he's the reason it is doing what it's doing, but the material is ultimately um, almost making decisions for itself just from the natural logic of its own physical qualities and what happens with the physical forces that Richard applies uh, and then that result from the paper being lifted off. Yeah. Uh, and that's uh, something that holds on through the drawings that followed and still remains true. Right, right. Um, it, it, can we just see the next one, Cal, just for context? And we'll, we'll, we'll mention this a little bit because this morning early I, I did manage to see there was a panel discussion at Pilar's um, gallery on the spot. And um, there were one question brought up in reference to John Cage or Zen in general, you know, and I know that Richard had traveled with John Jonas uh, to Japan, which is a very important trip for both of them. You know, we know the effect, the profile effect happened their work. But it just occurred to me, you know, G James, that the word Zen, you know, Zen is a Japanese pronunciation of the Chinese word named chat that say chat. Chat means in the Sanskrit means thought, absorption, or meditating, really, the word chan. But you can imagine in, in China, uh, if Buddhism or the word chan itself, if you go to the mountain, there's plenty of places in nature to contemplate, you know, but in Japan, if you go to the mountain, you see tons of people already there picnicking. <laughs> you can think it's a tiny little island. So the word Zen is contemplate, contemplate from what to what? <laughs> So the, the, the meditation in, in the Zen term, in Japanese term is internal. It had to be internal, can't not be ex externalized, you know? Mm -hmm. So I just brought it up just because before we see what we're gonna see, uh, the new series here, I thought providing some context is interesting. Just remind ourselves too. So this, uh, this is a photo of Richard on the left uh, and, and his friend, Philip Glass on the right helping to recreate a piece, it's called Slash Piece, casting, which Jasper have seen in a show, Anti-Illusion at the Whitney. Um, so here we are, it's in this photo one. I think we have the second one, Kyle, or not really? Yes. That's so, from Anti-Illusion, yeah? That's from Anti-Illusion, exactly. But the reason why I want to show this in reference to the vertical stripe, but also the throw in action, mm -hmm. refer to Pollock, which we have read many interpretation and whatnot, action, painting, so to speak. But what we want to see here now is directly into the next group of drawing cow, if it's possible, beginning with broader them vertical. Mm -hmm. Here we are. So this is a little bit uh, earlier, 2017. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about how this all got started? Yeah, th th this was the body of work that immediately preceded the uh, Orchard Street drawings that are at um, the gallery in London at the moment. Uh, and the 
one thing I should mention, because this is uh, this is an important shift. In recent years, um, Richard has started using um, some slightly different materials uh, more often. Uh, so this isn't um, paint stick. This is etching ink and silica. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you can tell looking at this and then, Cal, if you can maybe show the next slide, which is number nine. Um, no, yeah, that's it, number nine. Um, yeah, I mean, it, it can produce very dense, rich blacks because etching ink is um, so dense. Uh, and I think the, I think the silica um, does have some kind of effect on the reflectivity as well. So the way it captures the light is uh, somewhat different from the paint stick. So there's a, um, e even now with what sometimes seems to be um, limited means, um, a limited palette, if you don't see black as a color, um, then it's, it, it's still possible for Richard to find uh, considerable latitude in the effects that he manages to get onto paper in a given series, uh, just because of the material he uses and the kind of marks and the amount of pressure he exerts. Um, so the, the subtlety that's apparent within a given drawing is also uh, a trait across a series. And I mean, if we see some, uh, I, I know we don't have a lot of time, if we see some images from the installation at Audubas. Um, yeah, we can, why don't we go straight forward and yeah, here they are. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, that, that shows it pretty well. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's tempting to think of it in terms of it being a, 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 a language without a purpose. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not intended to form a narrative. The marks don't really articulate something. They don't model anything, they're, they're, the strokes aren't really contingent upon each other. Uh, they add up to something which is mm -hmm. different. So there's a, there's definitely a lexicon, there's a vocabulary, there is a language in his drawings, yeah. uh, but the resistance to narrative is um, so acute uh, that there isn't really even the risk of there being a particular reading. And in that sense, uh, I think you can look at the drawings as, um, generously disposed to the viewer uh, because they're not really mm -hmm. telling us in any way how to respond. There is, there is no orthodoxy that it's possible to locate for that. Although certain habits will make us see certain things in certain way. We think of a, a line that has weight as having gravitas and having maybe a dourness that a lighter line doesn't have. But those are just basically conventional habits from a history of drawing, uh, which Richard's approach to drawing uh, dismantles and doesn't exactly reconfigure. Yeah, I, 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 the reason, I mean, how, how can we uh, account, for example, that um, the, the accumulation, which you also mentioned in, in your essay, that create this density and then it fluctuate to the very incredible thin sinuous line, barely, barely exists on its own, or you know barely exists to the next one, <laughs> next line. Yeah. I mean, there's just extreme fragility there, as opposed to present and density. You know, yeah. um, and I know that um, you know thinking back from my first interview with Richard, where he recall the experience of having seen Giacometti, is it 19, it, it may have been third, early 30 when he was part of Surrealist, uh, woman with her throat cut, James. You know, yeah. identifying it, being the sculpture ever been sort of installed on the floor, that, that had an impression on him, but still that ap the admiration for Giacometti has to do with, with a sense of tremendous existentialist 
anxiety. And I don't think he ever got rid of it. You know, I don't think Giacometti did. And I think Richard is still ho I mean, struggling with it too, day to day. And you feel that in the drawing, this group of drawing, even more to me now. Um, I'm not so sure how you feel about it, but it, it's, uh, is it adequate to say that at the age of Richard is now probably 83, is, is it feel, does it feel adequate to, to consider that Richard is now enter in his conversational example with how Foster, the late style, you know, where, where you, you, you tend to make things simple, uh, reduce it to some other form of simplicity, uh, but either you tend to lean toward the criteria of pleasure, beauty, I mean, you see that in, in late Matisse, you know, with the cutout and beautiful flat color and whatnot, rhythm and, you know, finesse of the cut paper and edges, but I really feel sometimes the opposite. Um, his younger contemporary, Picasso, late Picasso is very anxious, um, including the, the late portrait that he paint himself like a skull, barely rest on his shoulder, almost like a, a rock about to roll off from a lens or, or a clip or something, you know? So I, I think this group of drawing seems to reveal both sense of it, some kind of reluctant to commit or acknowledge one way or the other from the internal sensibility. I it might actually call into question, this would be fitting if there's anyone, any artists right now who one could expect to call into question something we take for granted the way we've come to take the idea of late style for granted, it might be Richard. I mean, possibly the idea of late style just contains so many exceptions that prove the rules that there are no rules. And yes, I can look at this and I can see, I mean, everything you say is true. Uh, and the opposite's also possibly true. I can see aspects of this that are like the drawings after circuit on newsprint, but he made, you know, um, 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think, I, I guess the way I think of it, and, and this is definitely a component of late style, uh, it's definitely a component of having a 50 year career, a 60 year career without question, um, that there is, there is by now so much accumulated experience, uh, and Richard's always responded to, work comes out of work, he always learns from what he does. Um, so there's a repository of understanding and knowledge about what he's doing and why he's doing it um but maybe does just relieve anxiety now i mean maybe at this point there isn't realistically very much that he could do that doesn't um where he doesn't have the confidence of it being based on something he has already tested and been satisfied with yeah uh, and i think that may be something to do with it um on the existentialist point i completely agree that you know that is still present uh, because so much of it is always still about being in relation to and it, it's a very distilled form of existentialism but it is definitely there uh, and I, I i don't doubt i don't deny that one of the reasons i respond to the drawings is that i share something similar so outlook does matter uh, but I don't think it's, it's not the only way to mm -hmm. see it or engage with it, uh, but it does make it, it does mean that what he's doing can have a generalized appeal uh, because mm -hmm. it, it's irreducibly who we are. Right. Um, no more, no less than the way that some of us, you know, experience Newman uh, as a condition of architecture of our own body response to the work in relation to the, its architectural context, whether mm -hmm. the pain itself or where it's located. Like for example, the Stay from the Cross series, you know, at the National Gallery of, in, in DC is a good example. But the same times at we, you and I talk about, you know, Giacometti, uh, the way that the figure is stripped away and barely exists in space. Even mm -hmm. the longer we look at it, the more the figure itself began to 
dissolve into the air, the space around it, you know? So I see these drawings as a strange, very profound, you know, gravitation or sort of both and forth, left to right in the vertical formation as, as counting without adding. Does that make sense? Yes. Counting without adding the light and its density. So the wherever the light appear, uh, it can eat away wherever is there the form, but wherever the form uh, uh, counting that create the density is is the opposite feeling of of that fragility of light. Um, so it's 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 very uh, a kind of a I, I wish I can see it in flash, James. It's uh, well that'll be a trip to London, <laughs> which I recommend. Uh, I, I, I saw them in New York before they were shipped, and it was um, images can certainly they can only do so much. They're useful, they're instructive, but uh, seeing these drawings in the flesh is a is a remarkable thing, and and they do depend on that. Uh, and in that respect, maybe you know again there is something distinctive about uh, uh, Richard's graphic approach, uh, which is that unlike most drawings, it doesn't really translate all that well into a two-dimensional reproduction, no matter how good. Uh, and that's that brings us back to the idea you mentioned earlier on, that the predicating condition of his work is always to do with space and by implication, presence in time in space. Absolutely. Carl, can we go through a few images before we finally, um, yeah, just for pleasure, because I might not able to fly there to see the show, even if Paul Pilar might offer to fly me over, <laughs> I might not be able to, just so packed with things to do, Pilar. Wow, look how fragile those lights are, it's incredible. How can you make industrial form that feels like natural form without the representational of it resemblance, you know? It's just miraculous. So Kyle, let's see, we can look at, uh, for some reason, I asked to show Jackson Pollock Autumn Rhythm. Yeah, for the pleasure of it. So this is, <laughs> Just because I'm, I was at the Met not long ago, looking at this painting for a long time, I was so frustrated for not having the time uh, to drive over to see the Albert Pinkham Writers Show at the Weldon Museum in New Bedford, Massachusetts, where he was born. And we know in Melville, Moby Dick, uh, from the first chapter, remember the description when Ahab walked up uh, on flight in, in spouting, there was a description of painting, um, moody, dark, airy, vast, but however, the painting was small. It's, this description is identical to the painting of Abba Pinkham Rider, which we will see here. Pollock, Alden with them. Is eight feet nine inches by seventeen feet three inches. Now let's see, Ryder's Moonlight Marine cow. That's painted in eighteen seventy to ninety. Um, it's only twelve and a half inches by twelve inches square, tiny. And when Pollock on the interview, radio interview, was asked of all the American master, who's your most admired painter? And you say Albert Pinkham Ryder. So I want to put it here. Um, why? Because I thought of two things. One is the unconventional used material for Ryder. I know that some people don't believe it because they, they disagree uh, on what material is used, but definitely unconventional um, with with the wax and everything else. Some people say it's animal fat or candle grease, but wherever it is, it's certainly very advanced, James. He treated sky and the sea 
with same physical touch. You know, I mean, he was painting at the same time with Cezanne. Uh, but here, the broadness of it all, I mean, this tiny little painting, to me, the longer you look, the vastness of space it becomes and you feel it. Where I could argue with all the rhythm, painted rather late, 1950, I think, four years before Pollock's, you know, were killed in a car accident. To me, that's almost like re requiring a lot but you know, lost scale in order to generate intimacy for Pollock. Yeah. It's, I know that um, he didn't read, he was read to him every Saturday, whether Lee Krasner did uh, or Richard Howard, the poet. And he loved the chapter the, to the tail end where he had know that he would be swallowed by the, the whale and that tiny glimpse of white light. That's what he really tried to his work. Um, so one is the opposite of the other, which bring up the matter of scale. You know, Richard's scale can be big, but it's also can be so intimate. Wouldn't you agree? I, I would. And I'm looking at the rider. And I, I mean, I wonder if the material in it could be whale oil, because there is a whale in that painting. Yes. Uh, and you mentioned Ahab. Uh, and it's when this came up, I mean, the, the thing that occurred to me is that there is a um, there is a particular American tradition of um, a, a kind of maritime sublime um, mm. that has that um, Kantian quality of uh, being related to a sense of uh, the moral self in the face of possible annihilation. Um, I mean, even to the extent that um, you know, the, the plaque on John Kennedy's desk with the uh, fisherman's prayer uh, that was given to him by Admiral Rickover, who was at the time, who was in the architect, basically, of the American nuclear navy. Um, there is such a, a, an impossible level of scale and magnitude um, woven into the history of this country um, that it's almost impossible to be a major American artist without it somehow coming up at some point. It's so uh, true. And, yep. it's, uh, and it's a problematic one because uh, it's very easy for um, that kind, that acknowledgement of vastness, that acknowledgement of magnitude and power to become unspeakably arrogant, which obviously at times we have been guilty of. Um, and I, I'm thinking of the extent to which Richard has, over the years, disavowed any kind of magisterial role with his work. I mean, he insists basically that, yes, he makes it happen, but it isn't all about him. Mm -hmm. It's not about autographic marks. It's not about the struggle of the artist. It's not about the great master. It's not about any of those things. I mean, this is so this is what we want magnitude to be, if it's to be generous instead of arrogant and authoritarian. Mm -hmm. It's interesting too, because we know a lot of early American modernists, for example, moderns hardly, you know, went to live in Paris, work there to Germany, only to come home to his home in Maine mm -hmm. and echo what Maurice Flamac once say, that intelligent is international, national, uh, stup stupidity is national and art is local. Mm -hmm. um, boy, did I say that right? Yeah, I think so. But it's just amazing how it took you to leave your home, you know, and realizing coming back, returning home is where you belong, where you belong. And I think that's not a bad place to end because I know that you and I want to talk about um, Isaiah Berlin because I think we have a last slide here. Am I right, Kyle? Yes, <laughs> this piece is amazing, you all. If for, you, for any of you who have not seen it, please go see it. It's a commission by Princeton University. It's called The Hedgehog and the Fox. So we know that Richard read that. Um, Isaiah Berlin famous essay um, and um, yeah it was made in uh, 1998 it's fantastic piece 
And I know that in my one of my early interview, I asked Richard whether he's the hedgehog and the or the fox, and he said to me, "You tell me." <laughs> so I, I say, "You are the hedgehog." You know, um, what do you think, James? Um, I think it's a case of pseudomorphism. I think he's a fox in hedgehog's clothing. Okay, say it's, tell more. Well, I mean, the, the, there's this idea, uh, the basic idea is that uh, the fox knows many things and the hedgehog knows one big thing. I mean, it's a, you know, it's, there are fables about this that go back a long way, I think. Um, and it, in, in a way, it's often a kind of uh, criticism of what can be perceived of as dilettantism. Um, but Richard, he's, his dedication and focus can make it seem like he's um, on a single pack and on a single track and avowedly sticking to it and um, making it work, bringing it into being. And I, I think there's a certain amount of truth in that. Um, mm -hmm. One of the one of the strategies available to a fox has to be to be hedgehog-like, perhaps. Um, but if you think about his life and his career, he has been so many things at so many different times. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and his sense of curiosity throughout has taken him in so many directions uh, that although it often comes back to uh, a certain a, a set of artistic precepts, I yeah. think what's animating it um, is far more expansive than that. Um, so in a certain sense, I mean, intellectually, he is willing to go all over the place. I mean, he's pretty intrepid. Uh, what he will, what he'll read, what he'll think about, what he'll look at, uh, what he'll say in relation to it, for that matter. Uh, but I, I, I certainly agree that if you look at a number of his sculptures from a given ten-year period, it will seem that there is a, uh, a uniformity to them. Uh, there is a consistency to them, um, but what's behind them takes uh, all kinds of roaming that is associated, I think, more with the fox and the hedgehog. You know, it's so interesting. Um, I remember uh, Berlin essentially pointing out that Tolstoy, for example, who seemed to escape the definition into one of the two groups, <laughs> you know, but essentially why Tolstoy's talent are those of the fox? His beliefs are that one ought to be a hedgehog, you know, because Tolstoy's own, um, I would say, reassessment of his work, particularly early on, he condemned Dostoevsky for using vulgar language and always writing the same singular subject, which is human suffering and struggle and whatnot. In the end, um, I think he came around to really profoundly move by uh, Dostoevsky. Absolutely, and I think you can see that in Kurosawa adaptation, um, the film Akiru, to live. Remember the doctor who lived alive, never examined his own life until he had cancer and then he realized he had a few months to live and he really lived with it full pleasure. Um, well, let's not be so heavy here. <laughs> uh, let's open up to the Q&A. Um, thank you, James, for uh, in-depth conversation about Richard. Enjoy it very much. Thank you. And, um, yeah, back to you, Carl. All right. Well, thank you, Fong, and thank you, James. This has been a really terrific conversation. I am going to pass the mic over to our friend, Lynn Crawford. I've asked on you. Thank you. This is just brilliant, um, you two. Thank you so much. Well, you three, including the work. Um, I hope I can corral this into a coherent question. But whenever I see this work, which I love, it, it just seems so muscular that I find myself responding by almost being the opposite, like hypersensitive, um, a little bit fragile. And, and I, it makes me always realize how when you have a shift in your body, you really do think differently. 
So even if you say there's no change, but there is so much change because even if you blink your eye differently or feel sweat coming on or want to punch something, it you realize there's these pathways between the two that um, that for me this work evokes. So I'm just curious to hear your thoughts on that. I think that's exactly what happens. Um, that's certainly what happens to me, and I'm. I see it in relation to what I think is a general tendency that's been emphasized in post-war art, um, where it's, it, it invokes an apperceptual response, but we become very self-aware of ourselves as perceiving entities. Uh, we become particularly conscious of um, uh, what we're doing and who we are as we do it. And so there's an emotional register to it that, uh, as you say, comes out of the physical qualities that induce you to be in a certain way uh, and to feel a certain way. Uh, I am sure there's variation. Again, it's a, it's a highly subjective thing. Um, but it, I, I think that's definitely how it activates the viewer, yeah. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, next, we're going to go over to a question from Brooklyn Rail comrade, Nick. Nick, you can unmute yourself. Hi. Well, thank you so much, James and Fong, for this wonderful conversation. Uh, my question is, uh, could you both perhaps talk about the role of negative space in these drawings? Uh, because there seems to be a great variety of density in the works in the show. So curious if you have any insights on that. Perhaps I'll send that, I'll ask James to take that first. Yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure um, what I think of the negative space. I'm not even sure that there is negative space uh, in a meaningful sense in those drawings because of the way they're made. I mean, the sheet, again, it's practicalities. The sheet of paper has to be there, um, but it isn't really a, a blank thing to be read. Uh, once it's got marks on it, um, you know, the, the ink isn't typographic or something like that. Um, nonetheless, again, by conventions, we do see it in that kind of way, and it affects the impression we have. It affects the articulation that does exist in the work. It's the contrast that we need. Um, and so I think of it as being a, a, maybe a corresponding space, um, as with... Um, uh, Donald Judd had this notion that space is made uh, and that really but what seems to be a void, what seems to be negative space um, isn't really negative or, you know, doesn't simply not exist. It is uh, simply uh, something that has to be there in order for other things to be there as well. And I think that's true with the uh, drawings in the show, for example. It's it's sometimes complicated by something, unfortunately, you can't see in reproduction, but there are a few drawings that have um, um, visible ridges where uh, Richard has put pressure on a steel on a metal tool from behind. Uh, and so even the what's ostensibly the negative space of the paper is never truly negative. Uh, even there, it, it can protrude. It <coughs> develops, I mean, it, it develops its own texture, uh, which isn't really visible in reproduction, but when you see it, it's it's somehow full. It's just a different color. Uh, so, I mean, maybe that answers the question to an extent, but I, I'm, I'm really not sure if there is negative space. Can I follow that, James? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that my own experience is particularly in painting, let's take, for example, Morandi, Giorgio Morandi. Um, there was a beautiful show along with Albers at the Bessuana a few months ago. Um, and, you know, we take it for granted again, you know, when Morandi was asked, why do you paint bottles in response? Well, I don't paint bottles. I paint the space between them. And I think that's, you know, that's one way uh, to describe negative space, Nick. But when you look at Morandi's drawing, it's the opposite of that, actually. 
uh, that the, the, the way that Morandi draw, it's quite similar to the way Richard draw, it, particularly his notational line, you know, uh, James, although mm -hmm. it's very not delicate and light and lyrical, it's decisively strong um, and certainly have physical presence as always do. But still, I think the idea of naked space is not just on what that could be a way to describe uh, Richard, but I don't, I don't think it's quite adequate because it's not really always by hand, you know? He used all kinds of material and printed in this instant with the Orchard Street is really a transferring process that we've yeah. seen in either Paul Clay have done it, certainly with Nola and other German expressionists have done it, you know, Gauguin was the first who done it so beautifully through his woodcut. A similar process, but it really relate to the whole idea how space generate congruity. Is you know that that sense of haptic mediation between your body more. It's not optical, so that's why it's hard to describe it, Nick. In other words. Emmanuel Kant had that concept very clear where he described, which is the, the word that James referred quite many times in his writing, a perception. You know, a perception was part of Kant's transcendental a perception, which is the condition where you experience things with this, yourself and your surrounding or the world coming together as one unity. So negative or positive, it's just too narrow to describe because it, 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 it predicate on the action of the hand most of the time, you know? So it, it's control chain operation, I would say. Somewhere between control chain operation in, in the Cajun sand, in the other sand is transcendental apperception. That's how I would describe it. Okay, but my best. <laughs> Well, I, I just want to thank you both for those brilliant responses. So thank you. And Thanks thank for you the for question. the question. <laughs> All right, next we're going to go over to our friend uh, GE. I'm asking to unmute you. Hi, thank you so much, James and Fong, of course, for this. I, um, so that's, the question sort of circles back to the beginning of the conversation a bit. You're talking about touch, perhaps. When Sarah touches the surface to make these drawings, these impressions, these marks, is it to transform a leap of life into a kind of a gate, uh, absolutely expressing the sublime and the pedestrian? As an explicit intention or uh, just as a consequence of what he's doing? Because... I think as a consequence, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Right. Uh, it, may be a, it may be a consequence, um, but... I think one of the, what follows from the openness is that practically anything can be a consequence. If we can put it into narrative form, as you just did with a question, we can probably find it in what Richard does because of the um, excision of the components of narrative. So, as it were, I mean, in the same way, but if you simply take all the letters of the alphabet and scatter them on the floor, uh, you can make pretty much any meaning out of them that you can find, and probably we can justify it. Um, so, I, I think this relates to the general sense of openness. Um, what makes that interesting, particularly interesting to me, is if that's true, and I'm not sure it is, um, it's nonetheless not happening in any kind of formless way, quite the opposite. Um, and that would be, that's quite an achievement, uh, but it's, it, it's not an achievement that I think has really been uh, considered adequately or maybe very much at all. Uh, and it's, that might turn out to be one of uh, the unintended consequences of Richard's legacy, I don't know. Um, I mean, there's such a body of work now that the, the particular way we get reconfigured by it um, is remarkably individualized 
and and no longer really seems to have very much with the the local history of um, American art in the wake of minimalism or post-war art more generally or anything of the kind. It, it, it seems to have um, transcended that. It seems to have gone into a new area of its own, which is, you know, what an artist with a career that long, I think, hope, in a way, hopes to do and when successful, usually manages to. So, I mean, the fact that I cannot answer your question is actually my answer to your question, as it were. Thank you for your question, Gigi. Thank you, yeah. And thank you again, James, and thank you, Fong. Um, and thank you to everyone who tuned in today. At The Rail, we have a tradition of ending all of our community events with a poetry reading. And today I'm thrilled to welcome our Poet Laureate of the Day, Micah Ballard, to the stage. Micah will be reading from Diane de Prima's Revolutionary Letters to celebrate its 50th anniversary. Poet Micah Ballard is the author of four full-length collections of poetry and over a dozen small books. He is a co-editor for August Press and Lou Garden's editions. Micah, take it away. Hi, thank you all so much. This has been amazing. I wish I, I'm in San Francisco and I wish I could start every morning like this for the rest of my life. Uh, it's truly an honor. Uh, so please uh, include me. I know where to find you. Uh, at any rate, I'll try to keep it brief if I can, but it's Diane de Prima, who is one of my favorite people, alchemist, teacher, uh, activist, uh, just an amazing soul who is still with us. And I'm, I'll be reading from, if you can see this, this is the new City Lights uh, edition of uh, Revolutionary Letters. And it's the 50th anniversary. It's, it feels so good as an art object. It's just, uh, it's so cool that Elaine and Garrett and everybody made it a hardback. Uh, it's just amazing. So just holding it and having it in the room can do amazing things. Uh, that said, I'll, I'll try to keep it brief, like I said, but it's hard when you're dealing with Diane. So uh, at any rate, I did find, I'm in my office at work now, uh, a postcard that I had on the uh, file cabinet on a magnet from 2018, February 20th, that she had written to me. And I was trying to... Uh, the handwriting is kind of encrypted at this point. So I'm just gonna to try to read what she wrote on the postcard to start off. Uh, Hound of Artemis, his name, his job, war, just the kind of animal you'd find in Mary, England, white with red eyes. Hound of Anaya, can't spell it. It was fighting in the street, a la Mick Jagger. Uh, so cool to get random things from Diane, you know? Uh, and so I'll, I'm just going to do chronologically from the revolutionary letters. I like reading books in a bibliomancy sense where you can just enter and leave at any time. Uh, but, and you can do that with any of her work. But in this particular situation, I just kind of, since there was different issues of it and so forth, and it's a 50th anniversary, I was just going to start with uh, revolutionary letter number 33 and then move forward. How far back are we willing to go? That seems to be the question. The more we give up, the more we will be blessed. The more we give up, the further back we go. Can we make it under the sky again in moving tribes that settle, build, move on, and build again, owning only what we carry? Do we need the village division of labor, a friendly potlatch a couple of times a year? Or must it be merely a cybernetic civilization, which may or may not save the water, but will not show us our route? or our original face, return us to the source. How far? Forward is back. Are we willing to go after all? And this is revolutionary letter number 44 for my sisters. As we know that blood is birth, agony breaks open doors. As we can bend graciously beneath burdens, undermine like rain, or earthworms as our cries yield to the cries of the newborn, as we hear the plea in the voices around us, not words of passion or cunning, discount anger or pride, grow strong in our strength, women's alchemy, quick arms to pull down walls. We liberate out of our knowledge, labor, sucking babes, we liberate and nourish as the earth. And I, I like these kind of short ones too. She's, they're kind of, they remind me of like little proverbs or something you would find or, uh, you know, or little small haikus. 
revolutionary number 46, revolutionary letter number 46. As you learn the magic, learn to believe it. Don't be surprised when it works. You undercut your power. Uh, this is kind of a long one. It's, it's kind of a cataloging one, but I, I feel like I should read it anyway. Uh, Re revolutionary letter number 68, life chant. And there's a quote. May it come that all the radiances will be known as our own radiance. And that's from the Tibetan Book of the Dead. Cacophony of small birds at dawn, may it continue. Sticky monkey flowers on bare brown hills, may it continue. Bitter taste of early miner's lettuce, may it continue. Music on city streets in the summer nights, may it continue. Kids laughing on roofs, on stoops, on the beach in the snow, may it continue. Triumphal shout of the newborn, may it continue. Deep silence of great rainforests, may it continue. Fine austerity of jungle peoples, may it continue. Rolling fuck of great wells in turquoise ocean, may it continue. Clumsy splash of pelican in smooth bays, may it continue. Astonished human eyeball squinting through aeons at astonished nebulae who squint back, may it continue. Clean snow on the mountain, may it continue. Fierce eyes, clear light of the age, may it continue. Right of birth and of naming, may it continue. Right of instruction, may it continue. Right of passage, may it continue. Love in the morning, love in the noon sun, love in the evening among crickets, may it continue. Long tales by fire, by window, in fog and dusk on the mesa, may it continue. Love in thick midnight, fierce joy of old ones loving, may it continue. The night music, may it continue. Grunt of mating hippo, giraffe, foreplay of snow leopard, screeching of cats in the backyard fence, may it continue. Without police, may it continue. Without prisons, may it continue. Without hospitals, death medicine, flu and flu vaccine, may it continue. Without madhouses, marriage, high schools that are prisons, may it continue. Without empire, may it continue. In sisterhood, may it continue. Through the wars to come, may it continue. In brotherhood, may it continue. Though the earth seem lost, may it continue. Through exile and silence, may it continue. With cunning and love, may it continue. As woman continues, may it continue. As breath continues, may it continue. As stars continue, may it continue. May the wind deal kindly with us. May the fire remember our names. May springs flow, rainfall again. May the land grow green. May it swallow our mistakes. We begin the work, may it continue. The great transmutation, may it continue. A new heaven and a new earth, may it continue. May it continue. Uh, uh, I have a couple of more. I feel like I should end there because it's such a great poem. Do you mind if I read a couple of more or are we out of time? By all means. Okay, cool. This one made me laugh because we all know this uh, as, yeah. Revolutionary letter number 101, why money makes me feel bad. If I feel bad, I feel bad if I get some. Why should I have it when other folks are poor? If I feel bad, I'm broke. I'm sure I'll end up being a burden to someone else, somewhere unable to pay half of the bills, the rent or the mortgage. I feel worthless and evil if I'm behind in my taxes. They're going to come for me in the night, break down my door. I feel scared and guilty if I get them done on time or not. I know there's a big mistake somewhere and they'll find it and I'll go to jail. Even though I told the truth, have a piece of paper to back up every number. I feel sure my tax accountant will despise me when he sees how little I make or how much I owe. He think, he'll think I'm the lowest of the low, but I'll always pay him as soon as I get the bill. How handle this? How feel okay? Do I have to stop giving money to truth out and other left-wing peacemongering animal saving orgs, giving so many gifts to the kids, the grandkids, the great grandkids? Turns out I lost the money last year. My partner's worried. I feel guilty because I lost money and even more guilty because he said, oh dear, when I told him, I want to crawl under the rug. We don't even have a rug, we're both allergic to them. I thought I'd be happy when all the taxes were finished before the deadline, but no, I'm not. I'm more miserable than ever, even though I owe nothing and nothing to show for it, unless you count this poem. I think that's about it, but I have two small ones, uh, revolutionary letter number 102. This is kind of prophetic. Uh, soon the only ones who'll know how to find us will be Google, 
and those small surveillance drones. And uh, here's the last one uh, that in a, in a sense of Diane, instead of reading from this book, of course, I had to make my own little Diane book through a photocopier so I didn't have to flip through everything. Uh, anyway, we just published this poem right before it came out, like in a one-shot magazine. Revolutionary letter number 112. Queen showed us how to sing. We are the champions of the world. While the ground under your feet is burning, sing into the mic. Don't hide your burning hair. Look pride, proud, stride off when your microphone catches fire. Anyway, that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Micah. That was yeah, terrific. Cool. And some of the uh, never before published poems in the City Lights new volume of Diane De Prima can be found in our November issue. So go check that out. And a big thank you to James and to Fong. Uh, we'd like to encourage all of our friends in London to go see the Sarah Drawing Show at Ordovas and our friends in Paris to see Sarah's new sculpture and drawings at Gagosian. Uh, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where we'll, where we'll upload today's conversation shortly. And join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a radical poetry reading organized by Cynthia Dewey Oka. You can now turn on your microphones and say goodbye as you leave. Thank you so Thank you much, everyone. Thank you, James. Thank you so James. much. Uh, Thank you. This was a beautiful conversation. Thanks, Paul. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you, Pilar. <laughs> Thank you, Natasha. Thanks, Beautiful everyone. Reading. Thank you, James. Thank you to Thank everyone you. at Ordevas. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank yes. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Natasha. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, so Thank you Pilar, for the beautiful reading. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Absolutely. Anna Kuntz is here, everyone. Thank you, you guys. Hello. Keep up the good work, James. Thanks, everyone. Let's be Thank in you. Touch. Okay? Yes. Thank Absolutely. you. Thank you. Hi, Helen, Haji. Hi. Thank you, you guys. Let's go to have some lunch. We <laughs> own it. We own it. Yes, indeed. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank bye. you. Bye. Much love and Take care. Thank you, James. Ciao. Thank you. Take care. Be safe. Thank you. Ciao.